today we're dealing with the synagogue of Satan. Most Christians don't even know what that is and I didn't know myself till recently. We all hear about Antichrist. For a long time I've said there is no Antichrist figure mentioned in the Bible. They only go on what's said in Daniel chapter 9 25 to 27 and they have the absolute wrong interpretation from the King James Version if you looked at the uh, an, uh, if you looked at the Greek Septuagint and the translation which is online you would see it's different and our New Testament is not based on the Septuagint which is the only true translation of the Hebrew that exists today because the Hebrew that existed at the time of Jesus already was somewhat corrupted and Jesus and the, and the apostles when they quoted the Old Testament they used the Septuagint and the, uh, the Old Testament we have is different. I've, look, I've looked it up in the book of Esther for instance and other places I've picked one up today, uh, yesterday a and uh, these Zionist Jews Pharisees that Jesus said were of their father the devil altered the text to suit their evil satanic purposes. And that comes as a shock to hundreds of millions of Christians who believe Israel is chosen of God, the people of God, they are not. Where are the chosen of God? The church of Jesus Christ. It says so clearly in the New Testament. And so we moreover have seen that there are three mysteries throughout the whole of the Bible. The mystery of godliness and, or the incarnation, the mystery of the salvation or the truth of the gospel and the mystery of iniquity. Just three mysteries. They all started in the Garden of Eden. You can find them in what God said to Satan and what God said to Eve. And you find them throughout the whole of the Old Testament and the New Testament. But it all ends up with the last three chapters of the book of Revelation showing the victory and defeat of Satan and, and his evil and sin and death and hell. And it shows the blessedness of the believers in Jesus Christ who have forsaken all those evils and who rest their faith in him in the glories of heaven depicted in our language but such glories that we could not even begin to imagine as is evidenced by certain scriptures that we can read. So to start off with we're considering the fact that in Genesis 6 the whole of mankind was corrupted. Well we know that. Those of us who read our Bibles but do we realize the importance that it holds? God destroyed them all with the flood. Now what God will do once, he'll do again, won't he? And as we trace this through the, the Bible, we'll see that there were many destructions that he made on people and on cities and on kings. And is doing so today. And will do so at the end of time when he brings in the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, the kingdom of our Lord and Jesus Christ alone as the only kingdom. Not on this earth because it won't be this earth. It's on the renewed earth and that's the mistake everybody makes. Well, when I say everybody, the majority of people I know. So Noah, of course, built the ark. And then he came out of the ark and there were three sons. So what happened after they were out of the ark? There's Noah with Shem, Ham and Japheth. We have the story in Genesis chapter 9 verses 21 to 27 etc. Noah got drunk. He should never have got drunk. 
It's a grave sin to get drunk. What did Adam and Eve do when they were in the, in the garden? They did grave sin. It's the story of the human race. And because of Noah being drunk and naked, Ham committed, well, I suppose you'd call it homosexuality. Uh, if it were female, we'd call it incest. I don't know what the word is. And so what did Noah do when he, he woke up and his drunkenness was gone and he remembered what had happened? He said, Cursed be Canaan. That's Ham. A servant of servants he shall be to his brothers. Isn't that the story of the black races? Their servants to their brothers. We are their brothers. White people are the brothers of the black races. We are the brothers of the brown and yellow races. We are their brothers, not their lords. They are the ones who are in servitude. They're there because of the curse. And, and we are used many times to put them there. But nevertheless, in God's sight, we are their brothers. Then he said, Blessed be the Lord, Jehovah, the God of Shem. And let me say this. Messianic Jews have so intruded their false beliefs into the church of Jesus Christ that Jewish customs are being, being taken on in church after church the menorah, and, the, uh, and even, e even priestly garments and, uh, and uh, flags and their musical instruments. But this is the worst thing. They try to get English-speaking people to say Yeshua. That's not our language. Our language is English. It's Jesus. And I would think the reason they do that goes back to the Talmud which is the most evil book you could ever imagine, which is their Bible. The Old Testament is not the Bible of Zionism. Christian Zionists are fooled and deceived by Satan himself. We all have been, to a certain degree, those of us who don't follow it like Haggai, he's greatly deceived and deceiving others. Because in the Talmud it is stated that Hebrew is the celestial language. Oh no. Hebrew is not the language of our heaven. Their heaven does, is not the same as ours anyway. Not Hebrew. I think we mentioned this last week without my knowing this particular fact. It's not English. It's not anything to do with this earth, the language of heaven. We don't know what it is. And speaking in tongues is heavenly orientated, but it's not the language of heaven. It's the language of men. They do say angels, but I'm not sure what, how, how that applies because I don't believe that it really is the language of, the, of heaven at all. Uh, and I haven't looked to see what that means because I've heard so many people speaking in tongues and you can tell it's some language of earth and I've even recognized some English and other languages. Anyway, Canaan was to be the servant of Shem. So the evil line, which Canaan belongs to, comes to be the servant of Shem, the Messianic line. The Jews of today are not the Messianic line at all. They're mostly the line of Canaan and Japheth. In fact, most, most, messi uh, most Jews today are from the line of Japheth. 90% of them came out of Khazaria and they went to Russia and Germany and Poland. They, they are the Ashkenaz Jews. And incidentally, that word is even set, is stated as such in Genesis 10, chapter 3. It says, the sons of Japheth were, and then it mentions, and Magog. So Magog is definitely uh, not Russia that everybody's been talking about for years that I used to hear. 
The sons of Japheth were Gomer and Magog. It's, it doesn't exist today, that, that nation. And goes on to Jubal, who was the originator of music. And then it goes on to verse 3, the sons of Gomer at, were Ashkenaz. And you have those kind of Jews today. That's where they come from originally. Way back there. Very few uh, descendants of Abraham. And then you have the Ethiopian Jews who are black. And the, there were probably some other black races there or maybe even yellow and brown. They are despised by the Zionists in Israel today. Dating back quite a few years. So then we have... As we look at this in the, in the book of Genesis, in verse 10, verse, chapter 10, the beginning of the kingdom, of his kingdom, that's Nimrod's, was Babel. Nimrod was a most evil person. He introduced the, the snake religion. They built Babel, the city of Babel as you know, in chapter 11. And they had journeyed east and found a plain in the land of Shino. Of course, that's somewhere in uh, Mesopotamia. And so, you know the story, they wanted to build a city up to heaven. And they, God changed their language. Then in that chapter, it records the descendants of Sem, Shem. And among them, in verse 16, is somebody who was the father of Peleg. And there is a verse, and I hope I can go to it easily, where, where it says that Peleg, uh, I've lost it, but I know it's there. At, when Peleg came along, there was a division. Because... He was of Shem, the Messianic line, but the others were of Nimrod, Canaan, Ham, and Japheth, specifically Japheth. Okay, that's just a little bit of background. So what do we have then? At the, t at the time of Babel, it means confusion. Absolute confusion. But what did God do? Out of confusion, he began to bring his plan to pass, his order. Satan creates confusion. God creates order. And so the order started with, apart from Peleg, it started with Abraham, who was in that evil, around that evil area. He was actually in Babylon. And I read years ago of, of archaeologists who dug up part of that city where Ur of the Chaldees, where uh, Abraham was, and they had a library, but it wasn't paper that I could see. It was of stone. And, and I saw the picture of the stones. So it was quite an advanced civilization. Well, Abraham, as you know, left there. Then we, we, th we think of how God kept people all through the generations. I'll just do this quickly. Like there was Jacob, then he chose Judah. So Judah was the father of the original children of of Abraham who were in the Messianic line. The other ten sons of Abraham were not. But nevertheless, there was the blessing given to them and there was also the blessings that had been given but to Ishmael, who is the father of the Arabs and that's why Arab, Arab nations are blessed. They are with all their wealth in the oil, and they are the own. They are the Semitic peoples. 
the Prussian Jews are not Semitic. So when you talk about anti-Semitism, the Jews have made sure we, that it's their device. They've done it through their control of the media. For years, they've controlled the newspapers. They control just about everything in USA Today behind the scenes. They're the head. I've looked at, searched it up. They're the heads in, the, in psychiatry, psychology, learning, medicine, all kinds of, all the areas you could think about. They're there. Well, I don't, I'm not really pointing the finger as such at the Jews. I'm just showing you what God's plan is from the Word of God. And if you look at Genesis uh, chapter 49, you will see that Ga Jacob blessed his children and in verse 10 he said, in verse 9, Judah is a lion's whelp. He crouches, and as a lion, who dares rouse him up? He's not talking about Jesus Christ there. He's talking about the tribe of Judah and how they would act. That was their characteristics. And until the time of Jesus, at least, and beyond that, there were real descendants of, of Abraham by the thousands, maybe the hundreds of thousands. Certainly not the 50 millions, but the millions. But it's verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from beneath his feet until Shiloh comes. So Jesus Christ is not Judah, he's Shiloh. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. Starting with the book of Genesis, the mystery of godliness is that there is to arise a saviour. Here we have it. The saviour is king, but not king of the Jews. He's the king of his church. And later on, he's king of kings and lord of lords in his reign. Then we, we go on to some other thoughts. I tried to write it down because I, I, I didn't want to forget anything. And we come to the time when the tribe of Judah and, that, and Benjamin, Judah it was called, as Israel was called, the ten tribes of the north, they already had gone into captivity in Assyria around the 8th century BC and they were never returned to the land. As, as ten tribes. Most of them are lost today. There are three, some from three tribes that did return to Jerusalem. But they were not sent there by God. They just returned. But acknowledged by God. It's in the scriptures. But it was when they were taken to Babylon. Babylon. The seat and beginning of Nimrod and his religion all the evils you can think of. Every, every heathen religion, every thing that is wrong in the world to do with religion, Zionism, Jewry, Islam, Roman Catholicism, Buddhism, Brahminism, everything. All the paganism of Africa springs from Babel or Babylon. And here, and this is amazing, that God sent them into captivity into that den of iniquity. Now the, the children of Israel had followed idolatry century after century. You read it through the books of Kings and the books of Chronicles. All the idolatry they went into much worse idolatry than we English-speaking people unless we read no. They, but I, I saw on television the other, other day uh, about that particular religion where, where they, they give their children to the fire. The children of Israel did that over and over again. And there's a huge brass, brass figure of a man that can open its huge mouth, huge, 
and the families take a child. They themselves then go to where this idol is, dressed, and the children are dressed in black. And the children know they're going to be given to that idol, in which is a huge furnace of fire. And if a child objects, they were beaten. And then the parents would put the child in the mouth and it would be devoured by fire. You see that, you, you read that in the Bible, you know. And, and not the exact details, but it says that the children of Israel did all those evil things. That's why they were sent into captivity in actuality. Now, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel are full of what God said about the sins of the children of Israel. And yet God sends them to Babylon, the very place where all this evil started. They are sent back to the place that they really love in their hearts. And so who returned? By and large, the remnant. The remnant who were true to God. God always has a remnant. The majority never follow God all through the Bible. And today, the majority of the populations do not follow the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a, a remnant, a, a, a very great minority. I venture to say that what is considered as being the Christian population of the earth, maybe two billion, contains a remnant of those who are really belonging to the Lord. Well, there they are in Babylon. So what do they do? They take on more and in a greater way of the idolatry and the paganism and the occultism and the black magic and everything that was indulged in there and, and form it into an oral tradition that came out of the Old Testament. And what they did over the years was to make good evil and evil good. I have read some of the pages of the Talmud that's been translated into English. And I don't read too much. It's so filthy and evil. And I will say this. They consider, these Zionist Jews, that they are the Messiah. Not coming from our God. But they are the heads of all the nations. Everybody else are animals. They are taught to hate us from childhood. And they are taught to consider, and this is, this is by witchcraft and the occult and demon, demonism. So you can imagine how it gain, has gained a hold of them, generation after generation, those peoples, until this day. Well, the Talmud was an oral tradition so we came to the days of Jesus, still an oral tradition. Now we did not imagine these kind of things that I've been finding out. I always considered that all the Jews just kind of neglected the Old Testament. And when, when Paul speaks of the law as against the gospel, of course, he's not presenting to us the evil of the Jewry, he's presenting to us what is in the Old Testament, which is the law. He's not preaching the Talmud to us. He's preaching the Old Testament as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we don't hear about those things and we don't know it. And our Christian leaders, by and large, did not want to find out because you can find out, as I've been finding out. And I'd like to take you to some scriptures that are written in, in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel and so forth. What God has said. We'll start off with Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 20. And most of us have read these verses all our lives without it particularly sinking in. Because, you know, we, uh, I've always read the Old Testament and I have to say, I didn't understand a lot of it at the time. 
And I used to say, if I knew the history, I might understand more. When it came to these pro uh, prophetical books, is what I'm talking about. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 20, says these particular words. For long ago, I broke your yoke and tore off your bonds. But you said, I will not serve. For on every high hill and under every green tree, you have lain down as a harlot to idolatry. They had the images there. And maybe they worshipped the animistic spirits. That's what they did. And we have read that. Chapter 3, verse 1. So what does God say? If a husband divorces his wife and she goes from him and belongs to another man, will he still return to her? That uh, verse alone is against the restoration of Israel to the land of Israel. Uh, land of Israel. There's no such thing as the natural Israel today anyway. Will not that land be completely polluted? It's not the holy land. I've said that for years. Jerusalem's not a holy city. It's an evil city. Yeah. Palestine's not the holy land. It's an evil, polluted land. And yet the whole church is mostly believing in pilgrimages to look at, look at go all around Israel. Okay, that's all, all right if you want to tour and see it, but not as a holy land. God says, but you are a harlot, Israel and Judah, with many lovers. Yet you turn to me, declares the Lord. In other words, he wasn't taking notice of their turning to, to me, to him. And we'll, we'll follow Jeremiah so we don't have to uh, change our Bibles, our pages. Chapter 11, 7, verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? Now, where do we read words like that again? When Jesus said, and he cleansed the temple. And he quoted those words, and he was saying to them, you've robbed, you're robbing, you're robbers. And he overturned the, the, ta the tables of the money changers. You see, even in the days of Jesus, which we miss, the temple was not being treated as the holy place it should have been. I mean, Jesus even said, uh, God said, my father, you, my father said, um, my house should be made a house of prayer. That's what he said. It wasn't a house of prayer. And yet we think of all those people of Israel at the time in, in the light of the law. No, we don't need to because they weren't even keeping the law. And I have, I've said this before, I have wondered why there were so many evil spirits and the Pentecostal said it's sicknesses. Now, some sicknesses might be caused by evil spirits, but most are not. And I, then I said, well, they have to have been consulting the wizards and the occult. But it was worse than that because I have read from a, an ex-Jew that underneath the temple were images of idolatry where they said, uh, certainly the heads of the temple were doing obeisance. Now we come to something else here. And I'm sorry I have to read them. If you're watching the video and, and you get a bit bored with this, run it ahead because you should, you should hear what the Lord is saying because these are certainly not my ideas uh, uh, that I have even followed in any part of my life. But I have always believed what the Bible said. Okay, we come to chapter 25 in Jeremiah verse 15. For me, thus said the Lord, the God of Israel, take this cup of the wine of wrath from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you 
to drink it. They will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom the Lord sent me to drink it. And then he said, Jerusalem, the cities of Judah and its kings and its princes to make them a ruin, etc. So the influence of the people of the land, or if you like to call it that, and their descendants today, whether by generation, by genealogy, which is rare, or who call themselves Jews, have an effect on, on the nations to such an extent that it makes the nations mad with sin. I, I've been saying for ages, every time I look at TV and I say, the world's gone mad. I've said it for years. Isn't it mad? Yeah, this is what the Bible says. I, I, I've read that before, for never sunk in. Now it sinks in. Now we come to Gen uh, Jeremiah chapter, I think it's 51 of verse 7. Yeah, 51. Babylon has been a golden cup in the hand of the Lord. Babylon. Intoxicating all the earth. The nations have drunk of her wine. Therefore the nations are going mad. Suddenly Babylon has fallen and been broken. Wail over her. Perhaps she may be healed. We applied healing to Babylon, but she was not healed. Forsake her. And let us go, each one to his own country. For her judgment has reached to heaven and towers up to the very skies. The Lord has brought about our vindication. Come. And let us recount in Zion the work of the Lord our God. That did have a, a natural application to that time, but surely it has a spiritual application to our time. What do you think of the book of Revelation? Babylon has fallen. Babylon is that has fallen. That war that sat upon the waters, the waters of the peoples of the whole earth, it, it, it's a, almost a reduplication of what's written in the book of Jeremiah here. But you see, Babylon has been a golden cup, a heavenly cup. How do you explain that? In the hand of the Lord. We just have to say, well, that's, that's what the Bible says. We can't understand it. And a lot of people would not want to admit it that it's possible. Because you hear people say, well, why does God allow wars? He doesn't allow them as much as, in a sense, he organizes it, ices it, if you'd like to put it that way, or plans it, so that the nations do it. Now, how that comes about, I do not know. But I never forget that story in the Old Testament. I think it was Ahab who was in his chariot and who was killed. And the Bible says that a certain, you see, uh, I think it was Ahab uh, and not uh, the other king. Uh, but anyway, it's at the time, the close of the reign. And, and nobody killed him. But then the Bible says a certain man, an archer, and picked up his, uh, his bow and arrow and just shot an arrow into the air and it killed the king. That struck me years ago when I read it. That God's power had organized it so that that man did that and his power directed the, the, the arrow to the heart of the king and he died. And I never related it as being concerned with judgment so much as fancy. God did that. That's our God. He's a greater God than we could ever imagine. And he's not a God like man. He even says that in the word. He is not a man that he should lie. He's not a man. And people and us and everybody, we try to make God in the picture that our mind would produce according to what a man would do. 
many times people in the, in the church it's done. Don't want to think that God is so far above us that he acts in such a different he heavenly way that we little humans who are the creatures and he is the creator are like grasshoppers in his sight and just have a glimmer of an idea as to who and what he is. Because there's so much goes on in a lot of the churches. Oh, God is love. Clap your hands, oh, you people. They never hear the truth of the gospel. I guarantee there's not one church in Australia where they, that gives every truth of the gospel over a period of time. And it would take a period of time. I've been in the churches all my life and have been blessed. Let's say it. God has his people. God has his servants. God, God somehow or other allows some to be babies, some to be middle-aged, some to go to maturity, very few. But there it is. But we always have to recognize the hand of God in, in blessing where, where it is because it does happen. Jesus Christ came to get a people unto himself and he's getting a people unto himself and he's getting a bride for, to, who will live with him forever and that's, that's the glory of our hope. But to think that God does it this way is beyond the imagination of any person. You would never imagine it, would you? But here it is, plainly written in the Bible. Let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 6.15. Except that in chapter 2, I would like to write, read these odd verses. He's taking, speaking to Ezekiel 3. Son of man, I am sending you to the sons of Israel, to rebellious people who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. Can you show me any part of the scriptures where the nation of Israel did not transgress like that against God? Never. He had his own people in them. Now think of Moses. We consider Moses a man of God and God considers him a man of God. But look at his background. Brought up in the house of Pharaoh amongst the enchanters and married uh, one of the daughters of, of a Pharaoh. And, and didn't he marry a, a, he married a black, a black person whose father was a kind of a wizard? Somehow or other, Moses was involved in that. He had to be. He was, he, was a, he, was, he was heir to Pharaoh for a time. He was the supposed uh, daughter of the princess. You know the story. But then God appeared to him. Even though he had heard the stories from his mother and father, he would have heard them because uh, she had access to him as a little child, if you know the story. But then God appeared to him. His whole life altered, total altered, after he fled into the desert. Ezekiel chapter 6, we'll read verse 5 in case I meant that. I will also lay down the dead bodies of the sons of Israel in front of their idols, and I will scatter your bones around your altars. Even in India, I mean, I've heard stories of what goes on in the temples. I mean, the dens of iniquity, prostitution, homosexuality, in the form of worship. We, uh, and in Malaysia, I've been to a snake temple just to look. In India, I have never been inside a temple. I've been to them. You have to take off your feet and uh, shoes, I mean, and I would not take off my shoes. In Malaysia, we just walked in. Of course, it's a tourist thing, you see. You could see all these snakes. They, they were either full of demons or drugs. They didn't attack anybody. There they were. Of course, drugs are connected with demons. The drug of alcohol is connected with demons. I read 
a couple of days ago that the archaeologists have dug up from the city of Babylon uh, the relics of their drinking and the relics of their gambling. And we know without a doubt that they're all involved in drugs, all, all heathen religions, somewhere a line along the way, use drugs to drug the people. And why do you think they use music to hypnotize the people? They use music. The Indian music drives us crazy. Same in Indonesia. You have to listen to it hour after hour on loudspeakers. Yeah, it, it hypnotizes people. The rock music in the churches today hypnotizes them to be acceptable to what the preacher likes to share. And I also read this, and I know this is true because I have read this in secular sites years ago, that which secular site I deem very honorable and honest and not following the politics of the politicians as such. And it was stated that rock music was introduced by the oligarchy of the world into Paris at the first, and the motive was, and of course this is, this, these are really the Zionists, the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and the Queen of England and, and uh, the Duke of Edinburgh and the City of London and, and the Dutch royalty and some Germans and, and French and Italians. Notice, it's Westerners. Isn't that strange? It's somewhat not strange because where did God place the Garden of Eden? Right there, you know where it is? In Mesopotamia, there used to be Mesopotamia. Euphrates, round there somewhere. Everybody recognizes that. Where did, where did the population start there? Where did it spread to? Palestine was spread all around those areas and then went off to the rest of the world. But the core of the history of the world and of the plan of God is there. And so, of course, what's the closest? Europe. Who are the people of Europe? The sons of Japheth. Who are the people of Africa? The sons of Cursed Ham. And who are many of the people, not all of them, of Asia? The, the sons of Ham. Not all of them. I mean, you can go to India and you see white people. You can go to Afghanistan. They're fairly white. I've been, uh, uh, like Pakistan. You go to Pakistan. They're fairly white because they come from Mesopotamia. They don't come from Africa. And many are, are Greeks of Greek descent because Alexander the Great's empire was all over there. And there's even a place in Indonesia, I think it's the west coast of Sumatra or Borneo, I forget which one, where the descendants of Alexander the Great's soldiers still have their progeny and they are whitish. I have not been there to see it, but I was told it by a Chinese who knows what he's talking about. So you have all these mixtures of people. And I think we need to know this to get our worldview right. Like what is our worldview? What goes on around us? What goes on in the British Empire? What goes on in America? Now that we have television, what goes on around all the world? But the main uh, worldview is how we read our culture, our, our natural culture. Our natural culture is what we learn in school, of course, in our history and geography, you know what it's like. But that's not God's worldview. God's worldview is as he has decreed and planned and brought to pass as revealed in the Bible. So we need to take notice of what we are looking at. Now I also have in Ezekiel eight chapter, uh, chapter 8 verse 18. Therefore, I indeed will deal in wrath. My eye will have no pity, nor will I spare. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet I will not listen to them. There's another place in Ezekiel 
where it, it relates this to chapter 19. Can we turn to chapter 19? And this was a bit of a shock to me. Because it mentioned in the, uh, the, the commentary that I happened to look at in relation to Ezekiel, it mentioned, and I haven't checked this with the Septuagint because I, uh, I haven't had time, and Peter hasn't had time to download it for me. But it is not in our Bible. It mentions the verse 27. And I mention it because that's a, an extra tidbit about the fact that the Septuagint contains verses that are not in our King James Version. Now we'll leave that there for a while because I would like us now to think along the lines of what is being said in Jeremiah chapter 52. And there's, there's at least one other portion that we need to look at. Chapter 52, verses 31 and 32. Uh, this is in relation to the, to the fact that they were in Babylon. I, really, I must have put that down there for my own uh, reference. It has no reference to you. I would like us to go back to Ezekiel. I want to come to that, uh, that, that portion of Scripture. So before we get into Ezekiel chapter 8, I would like to say that there is great demonism at work today, not the kind of attitude, oh, the devil's at me all day long, but it's at work throughout the whole world in relation to politics, economics, wars, uh, church doctrines, much demonism. Well, I have discovered that, as, as I stated, the rock music, they had their first rock, a concert in Paris, and it was to bring down the morals of the West. This was about the 50s. Then, of course, they shifted to England and uh, USA, of course, and other countries. But they introduced it behind the scenes through witchcraft. So demonism is involved in all those rock songs that come across the air, that people listen to in their ears. But the formidable thing is that as relates to the church, that rock music that came into being through witchcraft is now in the church. The church has invited demons into its midst that weren't there before. But when we look at Ezekiel chapter 8, we see something absolutely terrible. Here's Ezekiel. He's sitting in his house with the elders of Judah, sitting before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell on me. Of course, he's in Babylon. Then he said, verse 3, this, this was the Son of God, the Son of Man, brother. He stretched out the form of a hand and caught me by a lock of my head and the Spirit lifted me up between the heaven and earth <coughs> and brought me up between earth and heaven and brought me in the visions of God in Jeru to Jerusalem to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court where the seat of the idol of jealousy which provokes the jealousy was located jealousy to the things of God. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there. And he said to me, look toward the north. So I looked towards the north. And behold, north of the altar gate was this idol of jealousy at the entrance. This is verse 6 now. Do you know, see what they are doing? The great abominations which the house of Israel are committing here so that I would be far from my sanctuary. 
but you will still see greater abominations. Then he, he beheld a hole in the wall, verse 8. Now dig through the wall, verse 9. Go in and see the wicked abominations that they are committing here in the temple. So I entered and looked, and behold, every form of creeping things and beasts and detestable things with all the idols of the house of Israel were carved on the wall all around. Standing in front of them were 70 elders of the house of Israel with Jaganiah, the son of Shaphan, standing among them. Each man with his censer in his hand and his, the fragrance of the cloud of incense rising. Son of man, do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are committing in the dark? You see? Behind the scenes. Each man in the room of his carved images. You will see still greater abominations which they are committing. Verse 14. And behold, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. That's the god Adonis. And you know why they were weeping? And I read this uh, concerning some idolatry. It was probably this one. The women would give themselves in prostitution, virgins even, or married women, in this particular case, married women and virgins. But they would stay in the temple, in the, the place of uh, idolatry as till... Uh, till some strange man came to worship and took them in prostitution, even if it's, they stayed there for years, it said. They considered it such a holy act. I tell you, idolatry is filthy. You should see all the gods that we have seen around the places in India. Filthy sexual creatures. Absolute filth. No wonder Indians are like they are. I, I remember reading that there was a famous dancer from... America, you would know her, maybe you've heard of her, and I certainly don't follow those people or their shows, but she went to India and danced. And it's said that, I read this in, American, in an Indian English magazine, and it's said that when she finished, all the men rushed towards the platform and frightened her to death and she wouldn't dance anymore. See, they were overtaken with their lust so much that they just went for her. I mean, who knows what would have happened? Well, that's what, what hap but that's what this is all about. The evil, and in relation to the things inscribed on the law, on the wall, like an ox or an ape or a crocodile that were worshipped, or a beetle that was worshipped. We've seen them worshipping these things in India. Not beetles, but I've certainly seen them worshipping monkeys Grown men standing in the street worshipping the monkeys that were going by. Educated men. These were Brahmins. Brahmins are educated generally. I tell you, the evils that went on in the Old Testament continue today in this world and they continue in Zionism behind the scenes. And the words of the Talmud are what present day Jewry is read on from childhood. They're not read on the Old Testament at all. I mean, I've always had a picture they were. Yeah, yeah. We have been under great deception, not of our own wills, but the church. And you know where it came from? Satan, through the Jews themselves. They infiltrated the Roman Catholics, the Jesuits. The, 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 the Jews... The Jews... Brought, uh, instigated the Jesuits, Masonry, the Illuminati, Rosicrucians, and Brahmanism is similar. And, and when I read some of the Talmud, I am astounded because I have also read pickings of the Koran, you know, never the whole book, and I'm astounded that it's a mirror, to a certain extent, of the, of, of the Talmud. Now, we were always told that Muhammad got a lot of his stuff from the Old Testament. Don't you believe it? 
<coughs> excuse me, this idea of Islam ruling the world comes from the Talmud, from the Jews, because Muhammad had some connection with Jews. There's, there's quite some stories there that I have just kind of looked at and don't know much about. They altered it. And even the, the, uh, uh, the, the Red Sea Scrolls, you know, they're yes, not... Yeah. That's what I was talking yeah. about. That. Muhammad replaced what many Jews were following in the Old Testament, you see. And, but that's long after the origin of our Bible. You can rely on most of what you read. Uh, don't ever be scared in thinking that you haven't got the Word of God here. It's all there. Some of it's changed. I mean, I, re I realized years ago there was something wrong with the King James, but not from that point of view. It never entered my head. But because... Uh, you know, I was an avid reader of the Bible. I wish I had such a good memory that I could remember it. But um, I would notice, and I would say to myself, now this verse could mean this, 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 this. And I get to come up with a half a dozen conclusions. And after some time, I started looking into the other translations. There is a difference. But you see, probably only a Bible scholar would notice it, like just your ordinary Christian who only reads the Bible every now and then. They probably wouldn't even notice that. But you or I and the likes of us here, we would notice it. But even if you come up on the King James Version, yeah, you haven't, you haven't gone astray in it. You've gone astray in it what you've heard from the pulpit, as I have, all of us. Just by reading the Bible, you wouldn't have gone very much astray. But so it's because we hear the preaching. Australia, Australia are mostly unaware of, especially just ordinary Christians, is the fact that there's manuscripts in all the, the, the prominent uh, Christianized countries of Europe in their museums that date back centuries. And that scholars do go there and that they take the time to translate them or revise them. See, we haven't realized that all this is, I haven't. In a measure I have, because I, I went to the British Museum, as I've told you, and I, 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 I've seen the actual fragmented, um, I can't remember, if, if it was in writing or printed, I can't remember, no, it wasn't printed. Because it got, it's the earliest, earliest little bit of manuscript of the Matthew that there is, just the first chapter or so. And I've seen other things too, but I vividly remember that. I, I never forgot I saw that. Uh, and so these museums have been a treasure store for many scholars. And unfortunately, these scholars have followed the traditional teachings of their churches to a great extent. And unfortunately, if they saw something differently, if they're, if they're very unorthodox, they will start a wrong doctrine. I mean, that's been happening since about the second century. You know, if you read church history, you know that. But we can rely on the fact that this is the Word of God. And if there are discrepancies and er uh, errancies and so forth, don't let it bother you. But I'm bringing it to us. I mean, excuse me, I wouldn't be talking like this to a congregation in India, for instance, at a deep Bible school, I might. To Apollos, I, I would. But, um, and some would, would read, some would watch my YouTube. So you've got to realize you're getting uh, everything that most nobody else would be getting. <laughs> so we say a lot of things. But I, uh, I, I, I wish everybody could know what I'm saying today. Because we're all wrong. We've all been wrong in our attitude. <laughs>